do my best to interrupt these girls and throw the questions in um, as we're going. But if we don't answer them throughout the tasting or the view, we will get to it at the end as we can. So uh, we are in for a bit of a treat tonight. Um, Join three. Uh, we've got Jen Pfeiffer from <coughs> Rocket Lab Red, uh, Claudia Small from Small and Small, and Cynthia from <coughs> Gypsy Caravan. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're in for a bit of a treat. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a, a wide ranging discussion touching on various things. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, Jen, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you and good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And g'day, angels. Woo! Totally pumped to be here tonight with two of my absolute fave ladies from Naked Wines, Sin and Claude. So good to see you guys. I think given it is a thirsty Thursday, we must confess, what are we drinking? Well, I am drinking a brand new, actually it's a fantasy, winemaker fantasy wine, which I don't think is on the site yet, but it can't be far away. Same. From uh, Vineyard. Very soon. So Pinot Gris. I love it. And Claude, that's from your new vineyard, yeah? It is. And it's the very first vintage that we ran the vineyard that, um, yeah, this vintage that we bottled. So pretty exciting. And we're bottling the first vintage of the Pinot next week. So, But is that 19? Yes, so 2019. Yeah, so we'd actually bought fruit from that vineyard since 2012, but we took it over for vintage 2019. So bought a Pinot vineyard on a hill. Awesome. <laughs> Sound financial decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so it's so cool to actually after having years of not owning your own vineyards to finally own your vineyard and and produce wine from that. That's like the most oh. amazing, satisfying feeling. So satisfying, really fun. So but did yeah. you have to change much, Claude? Did you do much to the to the vines or? Uh, we we are doing a lot of it ourselves, and we'd like to go down the organic track, but we've got sort of undervine issues with the hill because it's quite steep, and getting on it safely is a real issue. So um, we sort of working through that at the moment but no it's just more being able to do like the whole cycle like you guys I mean it's the most satisfying thing I think yeah so what are you drinking some I'm I've actually cracked um my 2018 Syrah that I haven't looked at for a couple of months so this was our first our first Syrah for um Naked and it's pretty much we've only been playing with Syrah for about the last five or six years. Um, but yeah, it's um, beautiful wine, quite dense. Definitely not like the Shirazes over the ditch. I mean, the other ditch, the ditch towards the mainland, not your the ditch. The mini ditch. The big ditch, <laughs> the little ditch. Yeah, so um, it's just, it's too bloody cold down here. It's like, gonna, I just checked the weather then. I said three, it's gonna be one tonight. So you need a nice big, big red for Tasmania. <laughs> Uh, well, funnily enough, I'm on the red train as well. Hard to believe uh, that I would be drinking a red, but I am. Uh, it's the Diamond Merlot. So I like to call this uh, Merlot with muscle. Um, it's, a, it's a wine that's got a fair bit of structure. It's got um, quite a lot of tannin for, for a Merlot and, and certainly can age like 10 plus years. So it's quite quite different and quite surprising and uh yeah I, I really love the wine I think you know it's going down a treat tonight we're not quite as cold here tonight we're five minimum of five but I think it's it's quite funny I you know Tassie is a very cold place and sin I've been there and stayed in your gypsy caravan you know <laughs> that Actually, was a bloody fun night it. wasn't it that was an awesome night it was a good night, yeah. So the Gypsy Angels, I'm just letting you know, the Gypsy Caravan is a real thing. Uh, and if the van is uh, rocking, you know what to say. Um, but uh, Rutherglen is really quite cold as well. We, we have a lot of frosts in the winter. You know, we can easily get down to minus three 
and minus four. Yeah. Um, and because we're a little bit inland, you know, we, we really get that sort of continental kind of climate. Do you get as many frosts as, as us, you girls? I don't. Um, we only get three or four because we're moderated by um, the so sea the around year. us. So because we're an island, yeah, we yeah we don't get hard frost at all. Um, and it's interesting. Like I'd say, last winter we probably only got two, but then we got more in the spring. So things are changing now for us. We have quite mild, dry winters, and then we get a lot of rain in the spring. And then we also get those cold which is the worst time to get it because you know, you've know got little buds that are that big and so we don't have helicopters like you Kiwis. <laughs> we go out and um, we have sprinklers, so we put the sprinklers on, but no helicopters yet. <laughs> Marlboro, you guys get quite a bit of frost. We do and um, we get quite hard frost through winter and also um, some years in spring. So probably the last really bad one was probably 2002 which took out a lot probably yeah, yeah. a lot um mm -hmm. and then also sometimes we have to watch frosts uh sort of uh like late april and things like that if we're having a late season oh wow, and the fruit's still on the vine yeah that's happened before um yeah and as ice my, wine. sorry you could make an ice wine Oh, yeah. Well, no, it doesn't stay quite that cold. No, it's terrible because you put the harvest, because the when you get a hard frost, obviously the leaves all turn brown, and then you put a harvester over it, shaking all the vines, so it pulls the fruit off, but it pulls all the entire canopy off as well. Yeah. And it's, yeah, quite tricky. It clogs yeah. up the hands and stuff. But, yeah, no, but it just depends. You get frosty years and non-frosty years. But this, uh, the vineyard, this is off is on a hill, so it just rolls on down to the neighbour. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. <laughs> hey, Jen, Jen, if we grew Merlot in Tassie, it would be more skinny and sinewy. It wouldn't have the muscle of the Rutherglen. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think we three come from really different uh, areas and different regions and obviously have... Um, uh, you know, those different qualities about them and, and Rutherglen is definitely capable of producing incredibly powerful wines. Uh, so, you know, uh, Jarif, which is, you know, one of the biggest reds going around, uh, is, is home, has its home in Rutherglen. And, um, and yeah, I think we do that, do that really well. That but variety scares the shit out of me. Like when, I, like when we're judging and you get the Jarif class, <laughs> it's like your teeth just go hello <laughs> run back into your mouth it's, it's a huge wine isn't it it's massive yeah it's a it's a massive wine giraffe has got like you know incredible color I like to say it's a wine you drink with your eyes because when you see it in a glass you just can't see through it it's as, it's about as black as poles pretty you know um, and when you pick up a, a bunch of grapes and you go squash like that in your hands, then your hands are just purple and black. The colour is just extracted so easily from the skin. Um, and likewise, the tannin is extracted so easily from the skin. So it, it really requires a warmer climate to be able to ripen those tannins. You know, I don't, I don't pick the fruit on sugar level. Um, I'm, I'm picking on flavour and the, the tannin ripeness because if you have a big red with a lot of tannin and those tannins are green, then that's going to be terrible to drink. Uh, you know, angels, your mouth is just going to go like this. <laughs> so it's going to be so bad. Um, so they've got to be ripe and voluptuous and give you that lovely richness and, and depth in the mouth. But I have to tell you, angels, jokingly, Sin and I often say that uh, we're going to make a Pinot Jarif blend. Um, but I'm not sure if I should put that out there because uh, too many people might think that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> I think, Sin, like you're, you, you've got an amazing story of how you've come to be in Tassie. Uh, you know, your your family have really been pioneers in the Tamar. Um, you know, what 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 happened? Uh, yeah, Jen, it's, um, it's a 
interesting story so we um we lived in san francisco i was born in san francisco um and mum and dad were well to be honest they were dabbling in a little bit of winemaking um my dad was a painting contractor and he'd gone up to the napa valley and um painted someone's house and instead of getting money he swapped um a ton of barbera which he brought back to the San Francisco Bay Area and made in his backyard in the garage. So they, and my mum actually was born in Cyprus. And so she was born um, in a wine growing family. They grew grapes for making Camanderia, which is a fortified style of wine, Jen. Maybe something else for your portfolio. Um, <laughs> but they, so they'd been dabbling in winemaking and they decided, because um, my mum my immigrated to Australia in the late 50s. Um, and so they went out to visit my grandparents, mum's parents who were in Melbourne. And they were looking to move out of the Bay Area because back in the late 70s, there was a little bit of the... Um, the Gorbachev Reagan Cold War and they were very close to a nuclear power plant and they were like well let's get out let's go grow grapes and we'll go up to Oregon or Washington a long way away from these <laughs> power plants and um, they happened to take a holiday to Melbourne and take a little side trip to Tasmania and they fell in love with the property that we're on now um, and they decided that that was the best bunker they could ever find so literally literally within so they they decided that they would buy the property it was an old abandoned apple orchard um its heyday was in the late 1900s so um the property had the bottom of the property had been cleared and but it had all these gnarly old um moss ridden apple trees and they just jumped the fence and climbed up to the top of the hill and it, the, even the road down the front of it was dirt road. So it was really off the beaten track. Um, only one very, very small vineyard close by. Um, that was a hobby vineyard, probably, you know, a quarter of an acre, really small point. Yeah, very small. Um, and they sat and hit, this old man had made these amazing pinots in his backyard and they just fell in love with pinot and they went, let's move. And so literally they sold up the house in San Francisco and the irony is is um you know that they that was the only time that the Aussie dollar was more than this than the American dollar <laughs> so they lost a bunch of money hold on no that, sorry. they lost a bunch of money coming over this way it's top bedtime in the Feldheim house and um yeah so then they moved in 70 we moved in January of 1980 and we were about the third like third commercial vineyard planted um, in the north of the state. Yeah, so we've, they did pioneer and it, we're still kind of pioneering some things. <laughs> Different varieties. Because my dad's Californian, we had to plant Zinfandel, which didn't quite work. <laughs> May work one day. <laughs> Gotta try all these things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's a it's an amazing um it's a it's an amazing story and to see you know to see that your winery I've got to tell you angels it is one of the most beautiful beautiful sites that you could go to it's a it's a glorious place and um yeah I think you know it's a it's fantastic to see what's happened to the industry down there and and for you guys to to be part of that through its whole um whole journey is is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's booming right now in Tasmania and um, it's very well endorsed by mainland corporates as well, which is pretty good. So that means that that they also believe that Tasmania is a good place to grow grapes. Mm. Yeah. And so how did, Jen, how did you get into wine? Oh, well, I was... Did you always want to be a winemaker or...? Sort of. Rest I, on I, wine. I was, I was when I was... Uh, when I was little and I had a sore throat, you know, we used to get to gargle muscus and, of course, <laughs> drink that. I and have a sore throat, Jen. My throat sore. And uh, and then when we had an upset tummy, we used to get brandy. So um, yeah, there was a few few minor ailments going on a fair bit for me as a kid. But um, you know, my my parents bought. The property which is now Fife Wines in 1984 and I was four years old at the time so most of my 
memory is from growing up on the in the property you know I used to come home from school off the bus and just go down to the cellar door tell my mum I was you know home get on the bike and just go out into the vineyard and you know dad would be working in the vineyard and I would be helping dad um but really just I don't really know what I was doing but certainly not doing it to help him um just riding around on the bike I'm, I'm pretty sure but apparently my mum says I used to say when I was a kid when I grow up I want to be the best winemaker in the whole wine <laughs> world just like my dad oh, oh that's beautiful that's adorable yeah yeah so I that that happened but then they found out um I, I as I said I was on the school bus and it was a it was a primary school and a high school bus. And, you know, that's pretty intimidating when you're quite young, but I developed a little bit of a side business. Um, I was able <laughs> to, anyone who's visited the Pfeiffer Winery will know it's quite an old, old building and there's lots of nooks and crannies in there. And I developed a little bit of a side business where I was getting bottles of, of musket, funnily enough, and slipping them through a hole in the corrugated iron from the outside of the winery to the outside of the winery and then I'd run around to the outside of the winery and get this uh get this bottle of wine and then I'd hide them I'd have a stash spot in the peppercorn trees in another sort of secret place and then I'd take them onto the school bus and I would sell these bottles of wine <laughs> to the high school kids when I was seven years old um, should I be saying this? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping Sin's child isn't beat now. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad the kids are not listening in the other room. <laughs> well, I didn't even realize I was such an enterprising person, but um, I really was. And then I didn't tell my parents this until like maybe 10, 15 years ago. And they asked me how much money I was getting for the musket. And I was like, $10 a bottle. And they said at the time, that was more than what they were getting. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant! So, that was, um, yeah, so that was uh, that was pretty cool. So I guess you never got caught. Not well, not by the people who needed to catch me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I guess a life of wine was um, was was uh, yeah was it for me? And I, you know, I can't really ima imagine doing anything else. Uh, you know, I, I love it. I, I love every every part of it. So, you know, it, it's just, you know, like all of us, it's our passion. So, yeah. Anyway. So how about you, Claude? How did you get into wine? Well, it's a funny story. Um, actually through corrugated cardboard. So my dad's family started a paper bag business in like the 50s in Auckland and they used to make paper bags in their backyard and anyway it you know grew and they went into like cardboard boxes and they used to make cardboard coffins which I always thought was quite ahead of the time environmentally and things That's like that right, yeah anyway um dad knew quite because dad used to sell cardboard boxes for the wine boxes um around Auckland with a lot of the Dalmatian families like I don't know if you know, but the New Zealand wine industry is like built by um, generations of Dalmatian families. So like Villa Maria, Delegates, Braincott, Montana, ev like everyone. So anyway, dad used to sell these cardboard boxes to the wineries. And then he and his brothers sold their cardboard packaging business and he had some money and he was good mates with Ivan Selak, who this was like in the sort of late 80s, like 86, 87. And it was when Marlborough was just starting to sort of kick off. And Ivan needed Sauvignon Blanc grapes, but he had no cash. And Dad had some cash and needed something to do with it. And so he came down to Marlborough, bought some land that had been like pea growing land for our local um, frozen food uh, place in town and got uh, Sauvignon Blanc planted on it. And um, so we supplied Celax and Nobolos for... Well, we've actually supplied them ever since. Um, we oh, still wow. supply. We still supply to Constellation, which is the company that bought Celex and Nobolos. So that's what gave me the idea. Because, like, growing up in Auckland, 
and doing lots of sailing and stuff like being a viticulturalist isn't something that your career's advisor sort of like it's not on their list yeah. so I was gonna be like do like an arts law degree which would have been a terrible idea <laughs> Um, and then a couple of months before I was supposed to start that I had like second thoughts about life behind a desk and so I applied for the Adelaide uh, University of Adelaide viticulture course and got in moved to Australia and yeah that's um, where I met Bill met him the first week of uni and um, oh. yeah that's how I sort of got into it yeah cool and your family still has vineyards Yep, yep. So we never, so dad never managed them. Like it was always a business investment. He always had a manager there. So yeah, same thing. So when we moved back, so we lived in, well, Bill's Australian and I uh, lived in Australia for sort of 10 years. And when we moved back, it was, I went to work on the family vineyards and then um, then had first child and then had second child and then got into naked. So yeah, that's how it worked. So we sort of have separate businesses now. Story. And that's a pretty awesome story um, too. I think you've got to share it with the um, with the angels. I mean, you are one of the original uh, winemakers for, for Naked Wines. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah no, we've been pretty lucky. And Marlborough, it's interesting you talking about Tasmania and in the 80s, because we find in Marlborough, it's so like we're only really coming into the second generation of winemakers. Yeah. And there's a lot that we don't know. And we've had incredible growth, but there's so much more that we can find out and so much more we can do with Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. And we've got all this time and these sub regions to sort of work it out. Like it's really exciting. Like yeah. I like being in a region that's not that old. I find, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So are you looking to promote the various sub-regions within Marlborough as a means of marketing the wines, you know, so wines from this region have these characters versus, you know, another region within it from, has a different character? Is that is that sort of what you're going down? I, I always find that a bit tricky because you have to be a pretty highly engaged wine consumer in order to really be able to latch onto that. So for us, like our Sylvia Reserve Sauvignon Blancs from a very particular part of the Awatari. It's from two neighboring vineyards. We couldn't make it any other way. It's from that area. So it's very much, you know, of its place. Um, and it, it's one of my, it, you know, it is my favorite Sav on Naked. Uh, you know, it's got, it's, got, it's got a red top. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's got a lot of complexity. It's got a lot of complexity and, you know, more complexity than you might expect. Well, and that's the thing. When you say things like that, I get really annoyed when people like slag off on Sauvignon Blanc. I didn't people... slag it. No, no. <laughs> no. So I'm saying, come, out, girls. come on. <laughs> no, but I guess my point is Marlborough's really famous for this one style of Sauvignon Blanc. But there's like all these other styles that we can make from different regions, different winemaking and all that kind of thing. And that's something we're really interested in. We do some, we've done like a series of project wines for the UK where we've like, you know, played around with hand picking versus machine, oak, old oak, new oak, blah, 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 blah. So it's kind of fun. Fume. Sorry? Fume. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. Except, like, I don't, like, I don't want to make a French one. I want to make a kick-ass Marlborough one. Come on. Tadanga Wai Wai. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's pretty fun. And that's something I'm pretty passionate about, sort of being able to show that Marlborough is more than just a one-trick pony. And I think the future of Marlborough, it's really important that we do show that and we continue to innovate. Because otherwise, pff, boring. Yeah. And also, other people get bored. So, hey, Claudia, can I just butt in? <clears throat> um, Fred Chilton's asking, <clears throat> who is Sylvia? Oh, she's my uh, middle child. And she was born just before the very first vintage we did. So she was born in February 2010. And we picked our first grapes for Naked Wines in April 2010. So we had like a little parcel of fruit that was looking really good. And so we asked if we could make a reserve wine naked said yes and yes yeah, so we did this little parcel of um reserve and we named it sylvia this was actually before anyone 
at Naked Wines had ever tasted a wine that Bill had made. They just sent us money and hoped oh, that we'd on. send you wine. Can't, you can't just say that. You've got to elaborate a bit more. But it's true. <laughs> no, no. I think because we were quite early in the UK and um, I think Rowan, the founder, talked to, he talked to someone in Marlborough and to this day we don't know who it is, but they obviously vouched for Bill. So whoever it is, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, don't, I would love to know who it is. But yeah, and so they vouched for Bill and they said, yeah, make, you know, 40 ton of Sauvignon Blanc. Like it wasn't like a small amount. And yeah, and so we were like, well, actually, when Bill told me about it, because we had like a two and a half year old and a newborn, and Bill had answered this press release. And he was like, oh, yeah, these people are going to give us money. We're going to make wine. And I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was a scam. Like, I really did. And then in May, this money turned up in our account. And I was like, oh, well, lucky we made that wine. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how, that's how we got naked. Mm. Oh, maybe some angels don't know that uh, Naked yeah, started in the UK and then um, uh, expanded into Australia and the US as well in 2012, um, which was when I came on board. And I, I got introduced to Naked from uh, my good buddy, Sam Plunkett, who I'm sure most of you guys uh, will, will know. And uh, Sam said, oh, I, I, he said, oh, you've got to go up and, and meet Jen Pfeiffer, you know, she's, um, she's a rocking redhead. No, he didn't say that. Um, he, uh, he just said, you've got to go and make, see her. She's been making some good wines. And, you know, I remember it was the middle of vintage and obviously uh, I had my dirty old work clothes on, dirty shirt, dirty pants, um, big hat. <laughs> no, no, the big hat, the big hat. Uh, and uh, and I was getting in a bit of trouble from my dad because I put um, no effort into my appearance for this meeting. And uh, anyway, uh, Eamon turned up with uh, Dom and David at the time, uh, David Parker, I think his name was, and they turned up and they were wearing shorts and T-shirts and thongs, and I thought, this will be just fine. Uh, <laughs> These are my people. <laughs> These are my people, that's right. And I think that's a really, actually a really important part about, about Naked is it's that um, shared philosophy. You know, uh, we are, you know, smaller independent winemakers and we come from, you know, family wineries, um, starting up our own businesses and things like that. And to share those same values and philosophy that Naked have um, makes it a great partnership. And it, it's, you know, we understand each other, which is really different when you're, you're dealing with say a big supermarket uh, or a big retailer, you know, who are focused on big business and want to work with more bigger wineries. You know, Naked has been amazing in introducing me and my wines to a whole heap of people who I would never have, have been able to do. And, and it's, and it, you know, and I think it's because of those, those shared values um, that allow us to work together so well. Yeah. Mm. How did you jump on board, Tim? Well, um, I had a friend in um, Forges in um, the south of France who was a naked winemaker at the time and he had been speaking to the, um, Australian side and he said that they might be looking for a Tassie um, team and, and as it happened at the time um, so David and I met in South Australia so I was wine making for a corporate um, wine company over in South Australia and then we met and um, and then we had a baby and it was too hard to go back to the corporate winemaking world with a child. I wanted to, I wanted to have a little bit more freedom with time to be able to bring him up and not be locked into hourly winemaking. And so we decided we would try and come back home to the family vineyard and there wasn't really a succession plan in place. So we worked for a couple of years, but we really wanted to find our own feet. And so we went up and actually visited um, Naked HQ 
and took a bunch of wines that uh, we had just managed to get this um, vineyard just up the road um, and we decided we would try and make our own wines and still make the family wines but we just wanted to go out and have a bit of our own autonomy and um, we didn't really have a place at that stage to sell them it was just great fruit in fact I think we cracked one of the the bottles from um, one of the Chardonnays from that we found it in the cellar and it was like my god 13 was a really good year so anyway we uh, jumped up on the plane to to Sydney and it was quite funny because we had a toddler at the time and um, uh, he he actually took over the office <laughs> I think he broke, uh, accidentally broke someone's necklace tugging on it. <laughs> we were trying to have this business meeting and Ari's crawling all over the floor underneath people's feet and, and we're trying to be really, really serious about being naked winemakers. And, um, um, and luckily they, they said yes and put us on board. So that was awesome. Yeah, and uh, we, we've we've loved being a part of it. It's allowed us to, um, we were able to move into a bigger site, um, which allowed us to be able to make more wines. Um, we've we've just been able to grow since being with Naked. It's been awesome. Yeah. And I guess, like, you know, you just said that you've been a corporate winemaker, so working for one of the, the big companies, how do you find, I've never done that. I've always worked in my family, family business. So how do you find, what are the differences? And like Claude, you, you've done the same as well. Like, you know, how can you describe what it is like working for a big, big winery as opposed to working for yourself and, 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 you know, having that, that total ownership? I think definitely pros and cons. I mean, the, the thing is, is I would always suggest to someone who wanted to be a winemaker to definitely go and work in the corporate world. Definitely. I mean, we worked, um, we, we, we were able to play with all these toys, you know, like we were, yes, they were like, here, try it do this barrel trial and do this micro-oxygenation trial and do this tannin trial and do this. I mean, um, and as when I went in there as an assistant winemaker, I mean, I'm, I'd done the years of washing and cleaning tanks, but by then you were, you know, you were given a lot more autonomy. Um, and I was in there in a really good time. So in the early 2000s, so just prior to the global financial crisis, um, so we, we had a lot of fun on company time, you know. <laughs> um, but then again, we also, you know, we worked hard for vintage. You know, they would often be 16-hour days um, and you just wanted to be there. You, you, you wanted to make sure everything was going right. I and mean, we had six we had probably 70 or 80 um, just vintage cellar staff extra on two shifts. So it was a, a small city. And so that part of it was really good, but then there was also parts of it which were, you know, in the end, we some of our brands started competing with each other. Um, it was also at the time when there was a, a glut of wine on the market. And so, when you've been working with vineyards and trying to get the growers to um, increase quality and reduce quantity, um, but sometimes, and they really did hard, did a great job at doing that, but then sometimes their wine didn't go where it was supposed to go because of backlog of, of stock. So, yeah, those parts of it were really, really hard and that was a hard time to be making wine in Australia. Hmm. Off you go, kids. Go to bed. Say hi and go to bed. Hi. That's Ari. Off you go. Say goodbye. Bye. Off you go. Bye. All right, go, go, go. Sorry. 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 I completely agree with what you're saying about corporate. Um, I've, I've actually stopped now, but I, for the last sort of four years, I've been teaching viticulture at our local tertiary institute. Awesome. And all the students there are like, oh, I want to go and work for the most tiny boutique rah 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 one company and I'm always like go corporate you see so much you see so much um especially from a viticulture point of view and being a young woman I did a lot of grower work and so I love grower work you get to like go and nosy around everyone's vineyards it's awesome <laughs> most of the time other than around pricing around pricing is horrible but other than that it's great um and it just 
really opens your eyes up to the whole wide range of the industry. And I think that's really super valuable. Mm, yeah. Super valuable. Although on the other hand, the thing I like about working for myself is definitely the flexibility, especially with the kids. I love working with Bill. Although we used to work together in Australia. Um, and I like being able to, when we make a decision, it's our decision and we live with the consequences and you never have to do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Which I really, really Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, no. You have yeah. to do a lot of the hard work though, don't you? You have oh. to like wash your own tanks and like, you know, I'm out in the vineyard pruning now. So <laughs> it's raining today. So I had a day off. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, yeah, it's fun. Plus it's all your passions. Mm -hmm. You get to fully indulge your passions. Yeah, that's and true. Also, it's your books that you're balancing. Like yeah. you're the one that makes the calls on the compromises because there's always compromise, like with anything. Um, yeah, I love it. I love working for myself. Yeah. I, I, could, I have guess the, question, other way now. the question I have, yeah, could you go back? Oh, there you go. I mean, you know, some days, some days it's really nice to know, um, you know, that you know you don't have to think about anything except for your job. Like, so you can just go and do your. You know, when you're in a corporate world, you're just one of many cogs, whereas you're all the cogs when you're doing your own business. So, um, you know, and, and I. I lose sleep sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I forgot to do this or, oh, my God, I don't have to do that. And, um, you know, so you carry it with you in your cells, whereas I don't remember stressing so much in the corporate world because, you know, there was five winemakers, you know, making the wine there. So, um, but, no, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience and I'd always tell any young person wanting to do in the wine industry to go and try both. But inevitably, some of my favourite winemakers that I worked with then are also doing amazing things working for themselves now too. Yeah. My, my dad, he, he came from a, a corporate background as well. So he started his career at Lindemann's, which is um, very large large brand uh and and he and he says the same you know he really appreciated having that exposure working in a lot of, of different places and learning a lot about about wines and it's i guess it can be hard to get that exposure you know if, if you are just in 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 one place but you know i mean i've got to say i yeah i mean i i love i love working you know for yourself working in a in a family business i think um you know the dynamics of that is is a great team um and having you know building you know I, I don't know having the vision and being able to take people on that journey is is pretty amazing so yeah and and as, yeah. as I said indulging indulging one's passion so it's um you know I, I think you know for me the opportunity to make fortified wines which uh, uh, you know, is absolute an absolute love and an absolute passion, and you know, have the full support, uh, you know, of 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 everyone in the business to do it is is pretty cool because these wines are, you know, they're very rare and they're very special. And I think, you know, if if you if you don't have full control of that, then maybe someone else makes the decision that you can't make these wines. And yeah. and to me, they're so too special not to not to make. Um, well, there have been a lot of corporates who sold their fortified businesses. So, you know. Jen, I remember because um, I studied winemaking at um, Charles Sturt, which is kind of close to Rutherglen. And I remember coming, going away on a winemaker's weekend down to Rutherglen. <laughs> you know, I had the bus and um, we went to Pfeiffer's. It was amazing. I, this, just the smell of the old wineries, like where the barrel room is. Oh, my God, I love that smell. But we were lucky enough to, um, to taste some fortified barrels that were from the 1860s and uh, 1870s and just a little tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. But to know that that, that history, like, I mean, Marlborough and Tassie, you know, five decades, but you guys have 
you know, hundreds of years of great winemaking in there. So that's that's got to be an awesome place to just, you can stand on the ground and suck in information. Yeah, I think, you know, Rutherglen's a pretty, a pretty special place uh, because of that incredible history uh, and the way that the winemaking knowledge has been passed down. So, you know, fortified wines are definitely an art more so than a science. And you don't learn how to make them at uni anymore. You know, I, I teach at CSU and Adelaide about fortified wines and and we don't, you know, the, the, the time that's allocated to fortified wines is, is minuscule compared to what's allocated to table wines. Yeah. And so how do you learn how to, how to do that? And it's the, it's the dark art that uh, <laughs> is uh, passed on by family members. And, and I think... <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, but I think it's the, the magic is when you've got cross-generational winemaking, um, you know, because you've got someone who has nurtured the wines in the generation before you and can tell you the story of those wines and the vintage conditions and everything. And then you have the, the youth and the energy uh, and the excitement to take those wines to the next place. And when you have those two things with fortified wines, that is when the magic happens and that's when the yeah. best wines are made. And I've, you know, I've been to Portugal and, and worked in Portugal making fortified wines and I see it there as well. You know, yeah. the best wines are produced when you have this, this uh, dynamic. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I feel really lucky that I've been able to have that, you know, and work with my dad in that way. Um, but I also feel really lucky to have been, you know, exposed and, and brought into the fold of the other great winemaking families in the region and, and how generous everyone has been with those knowledge with their knowledge and you know I remember at the beginning of my career doing tastings with the local vignerons and there were all the big guns of Brother Glen there was Ambles and the Morris and the Chambers yeah. and, and these are the big houses of the uh of the district and my family was new and young and we didn't we didn't have as many wines as, as these people. And I remember going to these tastings and going, you know, if only I could be as good as David Morris or if only I could make wine as good as, as Colin Campbell, but being totally inspired by that because what figuring out what I liked about the Morris wines versus the Campbell's wines versus the Stanton and Colleen's wines and then bringing that into context with what we want to do at Pfeiffer's and being able to drive what is our own unique style now um, has been has been pretty cool, and I'm uh, you know highly ambitious because I I have gone on record to say that I would like to be remembered as Australia's greatest fortified winemaker. So get on, get on board, Angel. <laughs> Diamond fortified in your carts right now, and jump on board. This Jen, this actually reminds me of. Uh, how I first met you. I, I don't think I've you've heard this story, son. I'm not sure. Um, I first no, met no, Jean. No, no. <laughs> I first met Jean <laughs> on a UK naked tour. And so UK bring all their wine, lots of winemakers, put them on a bus, 10 days around the UK. It's massive. They have a London tasting, two tastings, afternoon and evening. And it's always at the beginning of the tour. You're always like jet lagged and you're doing two tastings and you're talking and blah, and by the end of it, you're just absolutely knackered. Anyway, this time I went and I sat on the bus and Jen, I hadn't met her before, came and sat down beside me. And she was like, oh, do you know what I've got in my bag? And I was like, oh, what? I was just like, Jen? <laughs> Rather than musket. <laughs> and I was like, and she's like, do you want to drink some? And I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. And so that's how I met Jen. Uh, Jen was like nicking musket uh, on a bus, just like straight out of the bottle. We were real classy. <laughs> 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 but let's not let's not forget the other part that the other winemakers on the bus, you know, suddenly saw us doing this, and then it became a bit of a cultural thing that there was fortified wines passed around each evening after the tastings on the bus for not just Claude and I, but for the other winemakers. Um, pre-COVID times. Pre-COVID, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> what happens on tour stays on tour. <laughs> uh, but it was it was great, and I I mean for me like that's you know that's the that was the beginning of our amazing friendship, and I think that's one of the 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 greatest things that I take out of out of Naked is the community, mm. um, you know, and like all the friends that I've made, um, winemakers and angels has just been yeah has just been amazing and like not at all what what you imagine when you when you first sign up to be a winemaker and you know it, it's like yeah I mean it, it, it's it's amazing and if the the whole thing fell apart tomorrow that's what you know that's what you take away from it and that's really important so yeah it's pretty cool yeah we've had some great times together oh Jen I've, I've, I've just forgotten something um I had a bottle of this the other day. Hey, that's what I'm drinking now. <laughs> and um, that was that was with my dessert for my end of vintage party, and it was amazing. Um, and I actually bought, I bought about, I bought a dozen or eleven of them, and then I've given, I've put five in five for each boy in the cellar for their 18th birthday. So I've locked it and thrown away the key so we don't go down and get it. But I think it's going to be a great wine. And it's so good to see something that's a vintage port that you know you can age. Yeah. yeah. When you can drink it now, but also to get something out with all that dust on it when you've forgotten about it after a while. So I can't wait for them to, they'll be saying, honey, Jen, that was beautiful. Can I learn how to make that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember when Jamie and I came to stay with you guys and, um, you know, we were having quite a few bottles of wine and uh, you, were, you were showing off all the good Tassie stuff. We'd had sparkling and Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Jamie, Jamie and I just sort of had a bit of a look at each other and we were like, it's time for a fortified, you know. <laughs> and uh, and you, were, you were like, I'll, I'll go and get a Syrah. Yeah. And, <laughs> Oh, let me go and get a wine, and uh, and I said I'm getting a fortified, and you resisted. You resisted. <laughs> well, that's because I know I'll go to sleep. <laughs> you were you were like we can't. Anyway, let me tell you, we got uh, a vintage fortified. Not not this one. Not this one here. But we we got a vintage fortified out and put it on the table, and it disappeared <laughs> like it was. <laughs> It went like that. It was like there was a hole in the bottle. Um, and and then I tell I kid you not, Claude, uh, after we drank that bottle, then Dave and Sin were like, we've got to get another one. We've got to get another one. And then they went into their cupboard and they're pulling out another fortified. And so never coming to stay with you. I wouldn't survive. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was quite a big line. Uh, the good thing is, is they didn't have to drive to the caravan. It was right outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sam, can you tell me about, because are you, is this your first year certified organic or? Not certified, but um, so we're going into transition. So it'll be our first year in transition. Yes. So super excited about that. And um if it wasn't for you bloody Kiwis, because um, I won a scholarship and was able to go over to New Zealand last year to study organic um, and biodynamic grape growing um, for the Tasmanian wine industry. And I was, um, well, because to be honest, there's not any part of the mainland of Australia that that's really like Tasmania, maybe down the bottom of Western Australia and Albany you know, that, that coastal, um, but New Zealand has way more similarities than the mainland. So, and you guys have a lot more um, organic vineyards. So yeah, I went over there and went to awesome Marlborough. I caught up with Rod East Hope. I caught up with Mark and Gus and yeah, I had, a, I had an amazing time over there. So then I've come back and Tasmania is a really, really hard place to try and go organic um, because, well, basically we have the most perfect climactic air, um, temperature and moisture so that fungus can just 
multiply. It's like having a party down here in Tasmania for fungus. So um, it's really quite hard to be organic and New Zealand's been doing it for a lot longer. So you guys have a lot more um, organic sprays that you guys make over there that we can't bring over to Australia. Like really? You, yeah, you guys are so on it. I'm, I'm impressed. I was so impressed. Um, but I did come back uh, and so this, so that's my second or third year of not using any herbicide. Um, I have sheep in the vineyard too. You'll be happy to know, <laughs> but not as many as you. <laughs> I knew um, it had to be a sheep joke somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we are we're we're getting um, the certification to go into transitioning, and I've got it. It's a bit it's a bit more difficult over here because, for example, in Marlborough, you guys have got like twenty five thousand hectares just in your little region. Like you could probably fit Tasmania in there about. I don't know, 10 times. <laughs> so you guys have, um, you know, an industry that you can rent equipment, you know, because a lot of the equipment to do things like that, specific, oh. specifically for undervine cultivation and things like that, is very, very, very expensive. Um, and so, yeah, so we're doing things. I spend a lot of time on a whippersnipper. Yeah. Mm. So it's a little bit harder, but I, I certainly believe in it. And um, I believe in it because, you know, those two little rugrats that were in there, the vineyard's basically an extension of our garden. So they run through the vineyard to get to the bus stop. So mm. I'd rather them go through chemical-free um, vines. And I do believe that um, it's a better way for the environment. I think it's a better way for, you know, industrial um, chemical use has it really only been here in the last hundred years and you can see the soil you know just flying off so it's a complete belief system for us down here and so therefore we're going to make it work we have to <laughs> yeah <laughs> um are there many organic vineyards around you or is there much of a community because there's definitely a real organic community in Marlborough yeah, you guys, you guys um, are pretty inspirational the way that you share the information and you all help each other out. We're, we have one um, certified organic vineyard in Tasmania, which is down south. Um, and the biggest difference between us and them is about 300 mils of rain. And we get what? the most, <laughs> which has a huge impact on, you know, again, that moisture, which is what the fungus likes. So, um yeah, but, but um, so on the back of me coming back from New Zealand, I tried to get a one day organic um, conference going over here in Tasmania, which was set for the 26th of May, but we couldn't do it. So it's just been postponed. So, yeah, and to be honest, we're, we're kind of looking at it like our wines um, have no additives to them except for a little bit of sulphur. Um, so we're changing winemaking as well to be a bit more gentle so that we're the, and, and less extractive um, so that we're not putting any fining agents or anything like that in there as well. So we're kind of taking it to the winemaking a bit too. So, yeah. Yeah, but you still get a hangover if you drink three bottles. <laughs> you mind if I in, uh, inter <coughs> excuse me? I think I'll just throw a few questions at you guys because there's a lot of love <clears throat> from all the angels out there. Um, uh, Hi, angels. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just start off individually, and then there's a couple for the for for all of you, but. Um, Claudia, there's a couple of remarks about the piano. Um, <laughs> Karen uh, asks who, what type, what make is the piano? And then there's another person who asks who plays the piano. And then finally, Kerry Forrest asks, is it Claudia in the artwork behind her? <laughs> yeah, that's woman with Sauvignon Blanc, not excellent. <laughs> Um, Love that. <laughs> um, so this is a Yamaha and this is my 40th birthday present to myself. Um, so I play the piano and also uh, two of the kids play as well. But it's my uh, stress-free happy place. It's, I really love it. Awesome. And 
another one for you. Um, do you think your Sauvignon Blanc, this is from Fred, will age like some Margaret River examples? I think they will particularly, it depends what, like our Theodore Reserve, which is a old style, it's uh, bar, uh, fermented in barrel, that definitely ages. We actually opened a 2011 uh, last year when we had some angels come visit and it was looking really good. Um, I find sometimes with the more classic styles of Sauvignon Blanc, when they age, they get that like tinned pea characteristic sometimes, which I am quite sensitive to and really don't like. Um, but definitely some of our Sylvia will age as well. But with aging wine, I don't know, what do you guys think? I sometimes think, not why, it's interesting drinking old wine and you get different things from old wine, but I don't want to enjoy a wine because it's so old. I want to enjoy a wine because it's like a delicious wine and it gives you different things. And obviously old wine and new wine give you quite different things in the glass. And I kind of think horses for courses. And particularly with the classic style of Sauvignon, oh my goodness, I just want to like drink it the year it's bottled. I want to sit in the sunshine in my garden and like, well, actually I want to weed in my garden with a stemless glass and drink my Sauvignon on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> with a <laughs> straw. <laughs> yeah. I have Bill's backpack with, you know. <laughs> I think that, I think the, uh, the, the, the way a wine or the ageability of a wine depends on the variety. Um, and you know, there's certain there's certain wine styles that absolutely um, benefit and improve with with time and with bottle age. And you know, but my big thing is always um, it's better to drink a, a wine too young than too old. Yeah. So sometimes I think you you hang on to a, a special bottle and you, you you don't drink it because you're waiting for the occasion and you forget to make the wine the occasion. And then when you finally open it, you go, oh, I should have drunk that two years yeah. ago, or three That's years ago. An awful feeling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a terrible feeling. So I'm, I always try and, and, and get them yet yeah, younger than older, you know? Yeah. I think it's like you should buy like a case of wine so you That's can- exactly what you have to do. Absolutely. Buy a case, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not <true>. <laughs> <laughs> while we're on aging, um, Michael has a question um uh, on the cellaring of the 18 Syrah oh definitely um so I think um there's still really good primary fruit that you're going to get now and as it ages so say that primary fruit stays for four three or four years after that you're going to start to get a bit more sort of charcuterie earthy kind of characters coming out of it so it depends if you like the fruit driven style um but if then drink it certainly up into the next five years I mean it will probably age for 20 um and particularly cool climate wines that have that natural acidity and lower alcohols <laughs> sorry no offense but <laughs> Um, yeah, it, that, so um, it just depends. If you want to go into the secondary, tertiary kind of characteristics of that undergrowth and the salami kind of flavours, then that's where we we think this wine will go after four or five years. But, yeah, so it will definitely age. It's up to you whether you want to have those older uh, aged characteristics. And, Jen, there's, there's numerous questions on here um, regarding the Duraf. Would that be potentially a, 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 a good varietal? For ageing? For ageing, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a powerhouse of a wine, so it's the exact opposite to Sin's cool climate little number over there. But I think, I think you know, it, it has, in, in its frame, it has the elements it needs to age. So, you know, it's got hugely concentrated fruit, and you know masses of tannin um a good lick, lick of oak there as well and so uh you know those structural elements to the wine allow it allows it to age and i you know i think giraffe is really great drinking um you know for 15 years uh quite quite comfortably for 15 years uh if not more but it, as the wines mature, as all red wines mature, they they change, they lose some of their primary fruit. So they're not so 
fruity coming out of the glass, they develop more savory characters, which is what Sin was saying. You know, her, her wine will go from the red fruits and the, and the spice into that more smoked meat kind of character. And, and a giraffe will go from that incredible, you know, dark chocolate black forest cake into something which is more earthy um, and still, still and a bit more chocolatey, I guess, but with a, an earthy savouriness coming through. And, and that's, you know, that's how the wines change. And so if you like that powerhouse of fresh fruit, then, you know, in all wines, whether it's a Giraffe or a Syrah or a Pinot, you, you want to drink the wines younger. But if you're looking for complexity and, and, and sort of, I guess, more savoury characters, then ageing is a great way to find them. Fantastic. Um, so we've also got a question here from Carol who says she's a bit worried, but she has a 70 year old port. Should she drink it or keep it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, more information, please, Carol. But uh, has it been uh, stored well? Where, where, where are you, Carol? Maybe I can come over and, and we can open it together. <laughs> Give you my expert opinion. So, um, I, I, I look, I think, you know, a 70 year old port would be a, an amazing tasting experience. And, and like I was saying before, don't wait for the, the, the occasion, make the wine the occasion, you know, have your family around or have some really great friends around and open it and enjoy it and, and think about the history of that wine, you know, and, um, and hopefully it's a cracker for you. Okay, um, so now we've just got some more general questions. So any one of you can jump in and answer. So Stephen uh, asks, who were your main influences as viticulturists um, and or winemakers? Hmm. Okay, I can go because uh, they, they roll off the tongue for me. I know that for sure. <laughs> I, I mean, I've been highly influenced by a lot of the... Um, great fortified winemakers in in Rutherglen. So I think the biggest influence on my career is my my dad because we've, I've worked alongside him my whole career. Um, so you know, kudos, dad. Thanks. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, Chris Colleen, uh, David Morris, James Godfrey, uh, who who's the chief fortified winemaker for Treasury. Or um, you know, he's had a huge influence on me. And then David Gimmerens, who was my boss at my first winery that I worked for in Portugal um, at Croft. He, he was just, just the, the right person for me. Um, he had so much knowledge and about the history of, uh, of Douro and port wines and so much passion for port wine. And, you know, I went to Portugal for the port wines, for the love of port and to be able to work with someone who shared that kind of that passion was just so inspiring. And I will, I will never, ever forget that time I had with him and everything he taught me, all those great little secrets on how to make vintage fortified. <laughs> uh, amazing. Yeah. Very cool. I think uh, Marlborough is lucky in that there are a lot of people who are sort of our age in viticulture and winemaking. And we've got a lot of good mates that we can talk viticulture and winemaking with. And so probably just like our mates who we can, you know, if you've got a, like something you're wondering about or like at the moment I'm wondering whether it's something in the vineyard I want to change and I'll, you know, ring up a couple of friends, chat with them, talk them through, talk through it with them and just being able to have that real open dialogue and in a really non-judgmental way as well. It's, we're pretty lucky here. Um, yeah. And for me, I think when I was um, in my early days making wine, um, I certainly as a female looked up to um, the very few female <laughs> winemakers that there were in Australia. And so, you know, I always, you know, wanted to um, be or I looked up to Savannia Cullen and Prue Henschke, Pam Dunsford, all the women um, and then I worked with some amazing women so um, uh, yeah a lot of my great friends were um, winemaking um, compadres back in those days too and they're making amazing wines now so yeah I've definitely been inspired a lot by the Australian women winemakers that are yeah doing great things. Oh, there's lots of blokes too don't get me wrong but you know 
<laughs> Fantastic. Um, we have another one here from Karina who asks, uh, she's really interested in the future thinking in wine. So uh, uh, what, what the wines that you're producing now, how will they be different to what you're making in the future or will they be? <clears throat> Climate change. <laughs> great question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think for, for us, um, particularly, we source um, predominantly all of our Pinot Noir from the Tamer Valley, and um, which is basically right out the window. Um, but I think in the future, um, if I want to keep the real, the very much the pinosity of Pinot Noir, so the the vibrant and crunchy acids and the, um, you know, delicate perfumed and not go to anything that's a little bit bigger in style, then I'll probably need to start sourcing um, fruit from either higher altitudes in Tasmania or a bit more marginal areas. So, or perhaps blending the areas. But I think that, you know, that's like five to 10 years away. Um, alternatively, you know, growing varietals like Syrah in, in our region is certainly happening a lot more. Um, Chardonnay, on the other hand, I think can cope with, um, co co can cope with a bit of climate change. So um, we can still get purity of fruit and great juicy succulent acid from, um, you know, temp from the climate increasing a little bit, definitely. But yeah, I'd probably be looking at um, Syrah for this area and um, Pinot Noir in higher altitude regions. Hmm. Yeah, I think for us, we certainly are looking at the varietal mix. Uh, you know, um, the, you know the, the future does look like it's warmer. And, and so looking for looking at what varieties successfully grow well in warmer places, say in Europe, um, and, and, and where, what, what we can translate across. And, and Rutherglen, with its history of fortified winemaking, has got um, quite an affinity and, and, and quite mature plantings of Portuguese varieties. And that seems to be, you know, a really good step for us. I think, um, I think our climate is well suited to them. Uh, and I think in Rutherglen, we're going to see more and more Portuguese white and red varieties used for table wines and also um, more Spanish varieties as well. Um, and even Southern Italian, I think, coming through. Um, that's not to say that, that we would give up on making the traditional styles, but I think we have to have quite a, a wide range of, of plantings to, to be able to cope with what the, the climate throws at us because we don't, you, you know, we don't know exactly um, what's going to happen. And I think one of the amazing things about vineyards and one of the amazing things about our industry is the adaptability. You know, mm. so. That's very true. And for us, we're probably, and it's definitely happened in the last sort of five, 10 years, uh, Sauvignon Blanc's quite uh, impacted by canopy management and exposures. And for us, looking if it's looking like having a warmer summer, keeping more leaf on around the fruit to try and keep the bit cooler, try and maintain the acids, all that kind of thing. We had 19 was quite a warm year and we did find you had to be a bit careful, the flavours started blowing out a little bit. So canopy management for us and also actually, and I know this sounds ridiculous, I feel a bit stupid saying this to Australians, but water is, yeah, water is an issue for us. Um, not that we don't have water, we've got heaps of water, <laughs> but we don't have enough water storage. It all yeah. like, goes out into Cloudy Bay. So that's something that definitely as a whole region we need to be looking at. Amazing stuff. Uh, I think we have to sort of make this the last question. It's a bit of a wide ranging question, but it's probably a good one to end on. Um, so Teresa asks, what is the hardest thing about being a winemaker? I think the lack of control with weather. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. The hardest. We think about all the good things. We're like very, very positive women here. And we think about all the good things. What's the best thing then? What's the best thing about being a woman? Let's answer the best thing and we'll give us some thinking time, Teresa. Sorry uh, to get, get that. Uh, the best thing is being able to sit down and 
drink a bottle of wine you made and go and like actually get down to the bottom and go god that's good can I crack another one <laughs> like I think when, sorry go like when you really really look at something you're like god I did a great job of that or but it, I mean it is it's all a part of you know the climate and the weather and all of those things the, the vineyard that you chose to get but yeah being able to be proud of something at the end of the day that you're like I would show everybody this one. <laughs> yeah. I, I think for me, it's like, it's wonderful to create something that inspires so much passion in me, but also inspires passion in the people who enjoy it, you know, and that's, um, that's pretty amazing and not something that, you know, most people get as part of their, their job. So, I, I, you know, I mean... I, I, is it a job? But for me, it's, it's just my life. Uh, so I think it's, you know, but yeah, for me, that's, that's pretty special. And I think the thing about wine is that it can be really diverse. You know, there's not just one, there's just not one element to it. You know, there's agriculture, it's viticulture, uh, you know, there's science in winemaking, there's artistry in winemaking, there's the sales side of things, you know, the commercial side of things, you know, there's plenty of things that you can get your teeth into and find what you're good at within that whole industry. And, you know, there's like, for me, there's never a dull moment. So perhaps the thing that I find the hardest is getting enough sleep. <laughs> <laughs> And I think you saying about how diverse it is, and that's what I really enjoy about what we do, because you just, like, every month is different, every day of the week is different, and I love, you're always on to the next thing. If things didn't go so well in one way the previous season, you've got a whole new season. We're starting from scratch. We'd be amazing. Like, it just, and you always get things that do better some years, things that do worse, and then you get to do it all over again. Yeah. I love it. And that's right. It's the challenge of improving and getting better with the experiences that you've had before and using that experience to determine your direction, uh, you know, I, I think is really, really challenging. And, and it's never the same, you know, no two years are ever the same. And so it really, you, you know, that keeps you so interested, you know, it's so cool. Fantastic. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there because you you do want to get some sleep, Jen. Um, there's, there's been so many comments on here about the the natural uh, communication between you guys, and uh, it's been a it's been a fantastic chat. So much information, and I'm sure everyone's got a lot from it. So thank you all very much for uh, for committing the time. Thanks, Great to you girls. That was so much fun. Thanks, thanks, Paul, for moderating, and thanks everyone for tuning. I did nothing tonight. <laughs> thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. We really appreciate yeah. your support. We absolutely love being part of this naked family, and we, you know, it's all thanks to you guys. So thanks for tuning in and supporting us. It's amazing, um, and thanks for letting us, as such great mates, chat about what yeah. we love. That was so much fun. Thank you, angels. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night. Good night.